Welcome to the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that for over 50 years has been changing lives through God's unconditional love and grace. I speak to this mountain. It doesn't say here that you pray, that you ask God to do something. It says you talk to your mountain. Implied in that is that you understand God has given you authority. And now, here's Andrew. I'd like to encourage you to get this free book that we're offering on prayer. I've got other product here, study guide, DVDs, CDs, but we're offering this book to you as our gift. And I tell you, this is a powerful teaching. People are praying, but many times they're praying wrong, out of desperation, begging God. They don't know the rights and privileges that God has given us. And I promise you, this would transform your prayer life. We're offering this as a free gift to you. So listen to our announcer as he gives you the details. And please call or write today to receive our free book on A Better Way to Pray. Get Andrew's A Better Way to Pray book absolutely free by going to awmi.net today. I started teaching last night on a better way to pray, not it's the only way to pray or if you're the devil if you don't pray this way. But I started the way that Jesus started in Matthew chapter 6. And he started by saying, don't pray like everybody else. Don't pray like the hypocrites because they love to pray. And then he countered people who prayed for show, prayed because they thought that the longer they prayed, the better it would be. He countered people who prayed because they wanted to tell God what the problem was. It says God knows your needs before you ask. It says don't use vain repetitions. That's like quoting the Lord's Prayer over and over. I remember one time that uh, I was praying for people down in front and a person had demons and they went to screaming and yelling and a woman on the front row, she just started going, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. She was just like a machine gun, just <laughs> shooting this thing out, thinking that somehow or another that would protect her from this demon. That is vain repetition. God never intended you to quote the Lord's prayer. Did you know that that prayer isn't even prayed in the name of Jesus? It's not a New Testament prayer. It's more accurate to say it's a model prayer. It tells you that you come in worshiping God, our Father which art in heaven, and you worship Him and glorify Him. But it was never meant to be recited. If you read just two or three verses in front of it, it says don't use vain repetitions. And yet people have uh, gotten all these religious traditions. So that's what I countered last night. This morning I talked about how that prayer is really about just relationship with God. And if we would love God and worship God, what the Bible calls eternal life, I use John 3, 16. If we really use prayer to just have a relationship with God, conversational prayer, where you just spent all of the time with the Lord and you just constantly were talking to Him and keeping your mind stayed upon Him. If we live that way, you wouldn't have very many needs. God would supernaturally take care of your needs if you put first the kingdom of God. But most people use prayer as something they do in a desperate situation to try and get some help. And that's the reason you're in so many desperate situations. So anyway, what I want to talk about tonight is another aspect. I encourage you to get this entire teaching because I certainly can't cover everything in these five services that we're going to have here. But I want to talk about tonight, this is probably the number one problem that I run into when people come to me and are asking for prayer. It's because they don't understand the authority and the power that has been given unto us. And so they're asking God to do what he told you to do. And the reason you don't hear from God is because God would have to violate his word. He would have to become a liar to answer your prayer. That's quite a statement. Look at this in Mark chapter 11. Let me give you an illustration of this. And beginning with verse 12, it says, And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. This is talking about Jesus was hungry and he had his 12 disciples with him. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. 
and the disciples heard it. And then it records how he went into Jerusalem and this is where he drove the money changers out of the temple. It's the second time he did it. He did it at the very first of his ministry and he had to repeat it here at the last of his ministry. This is the last week of his life. So there's a lesson in that, that even Jesus, when he preached, people didn't always follow through and he had to preach the same message. He had to do the same thing over. So he cast the money changers out and it says in uh, verse 20, and in the morning as they passed by, in other words, they were going into Jerusalem when he saw this fig tree, cursed it, and nothing to the outside looked like it had happened. But the, and then they came home that day, they assumed probably by the same way. But the next day, they walked by this fig tree again. So it was about 24 hours later. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remember, and saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. You know, we don't have the benefit of hearing the inflection of their voice. And the way that you say something sometimes can really communicate something a lot differently than just repeating the words. But I can guarantee you, Peter didn't just walk by this fig tree and say, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. It was probably more like, wow, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. And I don't believe that Jesus said, have faith in God. It was more like, have faith in God. It was like, what's wrong with you guys? I've been with you three and a half years and you're still shocked to see a miracle when it happens. So this wasn't just a positive statement. It was like, have faith in God. Don't you understand the power that we have in faith? And then he said this in verse 23, for verily I say unto you that whosoever, that means anybody, shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. We're talking about a better way to pray. And this says that when you pray, you have to believe that you receive when you pray and then you shall in the future have it. But this causes a dilemma. Anybody can believe after what you've prayed for comes. But this says you have to believe that you receive when you pray and then you shall in the future have it. Now it doesn't say how long in the future. It could be only seconds, a month or a week or whatever but it shows you that there is a time difference. You have to believe that you receive when you pray, not when you see it, not when the doctor confirms it, not when the money comes in, not when all of the problems are removed. You have to believe you receive when you pray and then you shall have it. And this is where so many people are missing it. So let me go back and point out some things here in this story. First of all, I read this for years and I thought, God, this is really rough. Why did you curse this fig tree? It wasn't even time for figs yet. But the problem is that a fig tree produces figs before it produces leaves. So this tree had already produced leaves. It was a pervert. You know, God is the one that created it. He's the one that told trees how to do things. And he, taught, he created fig trees by his word. And this fig tree was acting in a perverted form from what he created it to do. And so he had every right as creator to curse this fig tree because it professed that it had something that it didn't. And so he cursed it. And notice down here in verse 14, it says, Jesus answered and said unto it. In other words, this, he didn't only talk to a tree but the tree had talked to him. It says he answered it. Did you know things will talk to you? Did you know your wallet, your checkbook, your bank statement will talk to you? It'll tell you that faith didn't work. Your body sometimes will talk to you and say, well, you prayed for healing, but man, you aren't healed. How do you know? Because I don't feel healed. I don't look healed. I can still see the problem. 
Anything that talks to you, whether it's alive or not, you talk to it. You speak to it. Jesus didn't do anything to this fig tree. He didn't dig it up. He didn't pour salt on it. He didn't chop it down. He spoke words to it. And this fig tree, it said, died immediately. If you read the same account in Matthew's deal, it says immediately the fig tree died. But they didn't notice the difference until the next day. And the reason is because down here in verse 20, it says that Peter saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. So the moment Jesus spoke this curse over the fig tree, it died instantly, but it died in the roots. And it took about 24 hours for what had happened below the surface to become visible above ground. And you know, there is a great example here that everything God does, God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And God moves in the spiritual realm. And when you pray, like for instance, healing, and you say, body in the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed. The moment you pray, the power of God is released, but it may take a period of time for it to manifest in your body because God moves in the spirit realm and he flows through your soul. And if there's any doubt, fear, reservations, it can hinder and delay the manifestation. But God moved the instant that you prayed. I've got a great teaching on this and I hadn't got time to go into it tonight, but it's one of the most important things that the Lord ever showed me about what to do when your prayers seem unanswered. And it basically is talking about that in the spiritual realm, there is great things happening. There are angels moving and there is a conflict. Daniel chapter nine and chapter 10 told, tells you that God sent the answer three weeks before it showed up because a demonic messenger was fighting against it. And Daniel had to just stand strong. But if you can get this concept that the moment I prayed, God did it. Now, I may not see it right now because either it's a demonic opposition, maybe it's my own doubt and unbelief that's hindering it or something, but it is not God who didn't move. Anybody who sits there and thinks, well, I prayed and nothing happened. Why do you know nothing happened? Because I can't see it. Man, you're what the Bible calls carnal. Most people think carnal means ungodly, demonic, bad somehow or another. The word carnal just means of your five senses, controlled, dominated by your five senses. The word carnal, literally, the Greek word sarx, S-A-R-X, it literally means of the five senses or the flesh as stripped of skin. Not just talking about your outer flesh, but you know, when you say chili con carne, the word carne is the exact same word as carnal. It comes from the same root word and it means chili with meat. It's talking about meat. So when you say a person is carnally minded, you're calling them a meathead. You just are controlled by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. You don't understand that there's a spiritual world and there are things going on. He cursed this fig tree and instantly it died, but it died below the surface. You couldn't see it. And it took a while for what had happened below the surface to manifest above the surface. It's the same thing with us. The moment you pray, if you believe, it's a big if, if you believe you receive when you pray, then it may take a period of time before you see or feel or experience the physical results. But I can guarantee you in the spirit realm, it was a done deal if you believe. So you've got to believe that you, things are happening that you can't see, that you can't feel, that you can't hear. I've prayed for people before and I mean the power of God hit them and I know that they were healed. And I'll say to them, you're healed in the name of Jesus. And they'll say, okay, I'm gonna go to the doctor and see. And a spirit of slap just wants to come all over me. They aren't gonna believe that they're healed until some doctor verifies it. Now, am I saying you don't go to the doctor? That's not what I'm saying, but you aren't gonna believe until there's some physical proof. You're what the Bible calls carnal. And the Bible says that the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh or they that are carnal cannot please God. You have to get out to where you believe things are happening, that there's an unseen realm 
that things are happening in the spiritual realm, not only out there, but inside of you. There is a spiritual you that you can't see in the mirror and that you can't feel with your physical feelings. Oh, that is really important what I've said. And like I said, I got six hours of teaching on what I just summarized right there. And so the next day they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And then Peter pointed this out. And look at what the Lord said in verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Notice that the word say or said is four times in this verse. Three of them is the Lord talking about how you receive an answer to prayer. And he says, whosoever will say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that the things which he saith will come to pass. He will have whatsoever he saith. Three times it emphasizes the importance of words. I was praying with a man just a couple of months ago and he says, man, I've prayed, I've asked God, I believe that I'm healed, I believe all of these things, but I'm just powerless. I just don't seem to have any power. And as soon as he said that, the Lord reminded me of Proverbs 18, 21 that says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If you feel powerless, it's because you don't understand the power of words. Wow. Words are powerful. Words have the power of death wow. and life. Now, our society today doesn't believe that. People will lie. They will write contracts. And it doesn't matter what the contract says. If you have a good lawyer, you can get out of it. It depends on what the definition of is is. <laughs> Anybody remember that one? And people just lie and our word doesn't mean much to us. But you know, God, it says that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3. Psalms 89, 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. Everything that God says becomes a covenant. It's a legal binding thing. God cannot lie. Hebrews chapter six, it's impossible for him to lie. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3. If God was to ever lie, the entire universe, you and I would self-destruct. Everything is held together by his integrity of his word. Psalms 138 verse two says that he has magnified his word even above his name. At the name of Jesus, every tongue is going to confess and every knee is going to bow. And yet even above the name of Jesus is the word. A person's name is no better than his word. If he doesn't keep his word, then his name is no good. Jesus' word is powerful and he will not break it. He cannot lie. And so that's the way that words are supposed to be. He spoke the world into existence. Let there be life. He, you know, we say that he reached down with his hands and he created this and flung the stars into space. And that's okay for poetic things. But the truth is he spoke everything into existence. He didn't reach down with his hands and form anything. He spoke this entire world, you and me, everything into existence. Everything that you see was created by words. Everything. The dirt, the rocks, the earth, the sky, birds, animals, trees, you and I. We were all created by words. Words are the most powerful force on the planet. Did you know when Jesus was tempted by the devil? Anything, he was God. He could have said boo and it would have been scripture. But when he was tempted by the devil, you know what he did? He quoted scripture. And I wondered about that. God, you could have said anything. Why did you quote scripture? And he told me it's because I couldn't improve on it. It's perfect. The Bible says the word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. These words are perfect. When he comes back in the book of Revelation, he is going to fight a battle and it says that a sharp two-edged sword will go out of his mouth. I don't believe that that's physically that a sword comes out of his mouth, but the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. He, uh, Ephesians chapter six says that. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is describing that he is going to speak the word out of his mouth. The same word that we have recorded 
in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is going to come back and the entire armies of the world will be marshaled against him and he will just speak out of his mouth the word with zero doubt, zero unbelief. And it says that the people will be slain so that the blood will flow up to a horse's bridle. That means three to four feet tall for 20 miles. There will be solid blood and it'll take seven years to bury the bodies through the word that he speaks. That's the same word that we have recorded right here. The only difference is when Jesus speaks the word, there's zero doubt. So he said here, you have to say to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea and doubt not in your heart, but believe that the things that you say come to pass. And see, you can't just, you can't live your life carnally. You can't live it outside of the Bible 90% of the time. And then when the doctor tells you you're going to die and you're dealing with cancer, you say, okay, right here, I speak in the name of Jesus and command this cancer to go. But if you've spent the rest of your life not believing in the power of words and you say all kinds of things, you say things all the time that you don't mean, it confuses your heart. It says you have to believe that what you say comes to pass. There's many of you that tell somebody you'll be someplace at seven o'clock and you don't get there at seven o'clock. You just, you know, it's just a vague thing. You might get there at 710, 715. It doesn't matter. I was close. If God was that way, we'd all be dead because he upholds everything by the words of his power. He never violates it. You know, I just met, met with James Brown, the sportscaster this last week, and I was talking to him and he heard my teaching on the spirit of excellence and I was using this as an example, how that an excellent person never violates their word. If you say you're going to be someplace at seven, you'll be there at five till, 10 till to make sure you're not late. People who are late do not, they, they're liars. You can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> I'm going to love you. I'm not saying that this is a deal killer, but I'm saying you're ungodly. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a covenant and he will not break it. And if you say you'll be someplace at seven and you don't get there until 710, you broke your word. Bible says in Psalms chapter 15, verse four, that a godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. You know, I had a man come one time that was going to sell us a, an alarm system for our ministry. And anyway, I had an appointment set up at 10 o'clock and he didn't get there until 1030. And so he walked in and he says, I'm sorry I was late. You know, there was traffic and I just got stuck in traffic, but I'm here now. And I noticed that he had a cell phone on a clip on his belt. And I said, you had a phone. You could have called. He said, well, yeah, I could have, but you know, I'm here now. And I said, I don't need you. And he says, but I, I had an appointment. I said, you had an appointment at 10 o'clock. It's 1030. I said, if this is the way you're going to treat me before I get your business, I don't want you to be the person I'm dealing with. I said, if I have trouble hearing from you before I get your business, once I get your business, I'll never hear from you. I said, leave. And he got mad. Like, how could you do that? And I said, you aren't a person of integrity. I don't need your business. And I know that there's a lot of people, oh, I can't believe you're like that. <laughs> this is how you train your heart. You have to believe that when you say something, it's going to come to pass and you can't sit there and five times a day violate your own word and then have confidence that now I'm speaking the truth and now it's going to come to pass. Your heart will be confused. Your heart, so it'll say, what makes this different than any of the rest of the things that you say all day long that you don't mean? You have to come to a place that when you say something, it's binding. You don't say it unless you are willing to die for that thing quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> I'm just saying these things, not because I'm trying to hurt anybody or criticize you. I'm saying it shows that our attitude towards words are different than what Jesus said. Jesus said, you have to speak and believe that what you say comes to pass and not doubt. How do you keep from doubting? You, over a period of time, get to where you keep your words, you keep your words, you keep your word. And after a while, your heart will learn that when you say something, it believes it's going to happen. 
But you can't, li- you can't do 90 things out of 100 where you just violate your word. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. Uh, you just weren't serious. You didn't sign a contract after all. You could back off of it. We exaggerate things. We say that there was 5,000 people at this meeting when the truth was there were just a few hundred. You're lying. You know how to get over exaggerating? Quit calling it exaggerating and call it lying. I lied. You have to get to where you believe. And notice it says right here that you have to say to the mountain. This is where most people miss it. They say, oh God, the doctor says I'm going to die. The doctor says this and God, would you heal me? I ask you to heal me. You talk to God about your problem instead of talking to your problem about God. This says you have to say to the mountain. Say to the problem. What is your mountain? If it's financial debt, talk to it. Some people, well, what? I, how can you talk to money? How can you talk to bills? How can you talk to your body? How can you talk to a disease? Jesus talked to a fig tree and it says he answered the fig tree and said, things talk to you all of the time. And you need to talk to things. Again, everything. Did you know rocks, dirt, everything was created by words. It will respond to words. Some of you may think I'm getting a little weird here, but I think you're weird. Not to believe what the Bible says. Everything was created by words. The steel that's in this building, it was originally in rocks and it's been tempered and man has manipulated it, but it was created by words and I can talk and I can change the steel. I can change anything with my words. And some of you say, I don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. You don't believe that your words have power, but death and life are in the power of your tongue. And so the doctor tells you you're going to die and your friend comes up and say, how are you? And oh man, I'm dying. You just hung yourself by your tongue. You're speaking death. Well, I'm telling you the truth. Well, it depends. Are you speaking just the natural truth? Or are you speaking the truth? God's word is truth. You know, notice it goes on to say that you will have what you say. Most people say what they have But Jesus said, if you understand the power of words and if you don't doubt in your heart, you can have what you say instead of saying what you have. Saying what you have is, oh, I've got cancer and I'm dying. That may be a natural truth, but if you believe that God has put power in your mouth, you can begin to speak words and say, in the name of Jesus, no plague will come nigh my dwelling. Nothing that there's no weapon that is formed against me will prosper. That's Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. It says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And then the next phrase says, every tongue that rises against you in judgment. Notice it puts words and weapons in the same verse because words are weapons. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Unbelief comes by hearing words contrary to God's word. When you hear words, when the doctor says you're going to die, don't let that word just go out there. It's got power of death in it. Counter it. It, Notice it says, this is back to Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You could say you have to condemn. You have to judge it. We live in a fallen world and negative things are going to be said about you, but you're the one that establishes whether it has any power over you or not. Kenneth Hagin used to say, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. And you know how you take thoughts? Thoughts come. You were in a fallen world and people are going to say things, but you know how you keep that from having any root in you? It says in Matthew chapter six, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we be clothed with? The way you take a thought is when you say it. You can have thoughts come to you, but if you don't repeat it out of your mouth, it doesn't have any power on you. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. What you say about you is more important than what anybody else says about you. 
So if the doctor tells you you're going to die, counter it, condemn that. No, in the name of Jesus. Get Andrew's A Better Way to Pray book absolutely free by going to awmi.net today. This offer is limited to one free book per household and is only available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. A Better Way to Pray is also available as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast and as a companion study guide. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. You know, many years ago, my board made me go for a uh, stress test because they were trying to get me to have an insurance policy. And so I went for this stress test and it was a treadmill test and I did it for 15 minutes. And and anyway, it's a long story. I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but they wanted to shave my chest and put these electrodes on it. And I told them, this is virgin hair. It's never been touched. I said, I don't want you to shave my chest. And so, so they let me put these things on without shaving my chest. And I had six of them on. And anyway, about the 12 minute mark, I, st- I was sweating and they started falling off. And so I was holding to, the nurse was holding to, the doctor was holding to, and I was running. And, and uh, anyway, I told them about my son being raised from the dead and all of these things. And so after the test was over, he was looking at the piece of paper and everything was fine until 12 minutes and something. And he, he, start, he looked at this and he started grunting and saying, oh, and just making these noises. and. Then he wrote down this number and he said, here's a friend of mine. I want you to go straight to his office. Don't go back to your office. You go straight there. We're going to do more tests on you and we're going to put you in the hospital and we might do open heart surgery on you before the day's over. And it took me just a few seconds to sit here and process what this guy was saying. And I just, I said, that's a lie. (laughs) And you know what I was doing? I was condemning it. I said, that's a lie. I don't believe this. And he looked at me. Apparently he wasn't used to people calling him a liar. And he just looked at me and says, what are you saying? And I said, I don't have any heart problems. I said, you look at that piece of paper and tell me that that says I got a serious heart problem and you might have to do surgery. And he said, well, there's just a little anomaly. And he said, everybody's heart's a little bit different. And he says, you could be perfectly healthy. I just think we ought to do more tests. I said, that is not what you told me. You told me I had a serious heart problem. I said, you lied to me. And I got on his case and I rebuked this doctor. And I said, how dare you curse me? And he just tore this piece of paper up and said, leave. (laughs) And he flunked me on my test and I couldn't get insurance. And so I've got a doctor on my board and I went to his place in Shreveport, Louisiana and he shot dye into me and then had me do a test. And anyway, he said, I got the heart of a 17 year old, said there wasn't any problem. But he says, don't ever trust those treadmill tests. They're wrong 50% of the time. They're wrong as often as they're right. And anyway, a doctor just said something. And there's many of you that I love you. I'm not against you, but you trust the word of a doctor is more real to you than the Word of God. The Word of a lawyer is more real to you than the Word of God. The Word of a family member and their criticism is more real to you than the Word of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. And that's what I live by. I live by what God says about me. And if you are going to say something to me contrary to what God says, well, then you're a liar. I know I'm not politically correct. I know that I'm not seeker sensitive. I don't know why anybody comes to my meetings. 
I had one of my employees tell me this morning, says, I really enjoyed getting yelled at last night. And I said, I didn't think I was yelling at anybody. But anyway, I'm just telling you the truth. I hadn't got time to beat around the bush. That's what pastors are for. <laughs> pastors have to live with you. I just come in and tell you the truth and leave and you can take it or leave it. Amen. But anyway, I'm not trying to be mean with it, but I'm just telling you that, man, if something comes to me, a thought or a person says something that violates the word of God, I'm going to counter it. You can ask Jamie, we're driving down the road and they come on with the news and they say it's flu season. And I'll say, not for me in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to let people speak that there's a certain time of the year that the word of God doesn't work. And they'll come on on the television with, you know, that uh, are you having problems? And they'll start talking about this and advertising their product. And Jamie and I will mute the thing. We always sit there with a remote. To, we're going to cut this, these words off. And if somehow or another we can't get to the remote, I'll say not for me in the name of Jesus. If you condemn words when they come, they have no impact over you. But words are powerful. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And if you say, oh, I can watch television, I can listen to those uh, commercials and it doesn't bother me, you're deceived. You're deceived. If you think that hearing negative words have no effect on you, death and life are in the power of the tongue and not only your tongue, but every tongue, every word that you hear is either ministering life or it is ministering death. And I know most people don't believe that and that's the reason most people don't speak and get this results is because they don't believe in the power of words. They don't believe the words they say or even the words that they hear have any impact over them. I don't know how to make this any clearer than what I'm doing, but you're wrong. Words are powerful. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And he said, you have to speak to the mountain. Not talk to God about the mountain, but talk to the mountain about God. And you know, implied here, it doesn't spell this out, but if you meditate on this, this has to be so that for you to not speak to God and say, oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. I am nobody, but oh God, you are awesome. Would you stretch forth your hand? That's the way we've been taught to pray. You have just violated everything that God says. God says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world and no weapon formed against you will prosper and on and on. And so you have just distanced yourself from your power source. You've unplugged when you approach God that way. And for you to just come and not even ask God for help and just say, I speak to this mountain. It doesn't say here that you pray, that you ask God to do something. It says you talk to your mountain. Implied in that is that you understand God has given you authority and power. And I've just now got to where I wanted to get to, to introduce this. <laughs> the heart can't stand more than the seat can endure. But I'm going to say some things real quickly. Maybe I'll continue on this in the morning. But you've got to understand God gave you authority and power. The 10th chapter of the book of Matthew, he called his disciples together and gave them power against all sickness and all disease and all demons to cast them out. And then in verse eight, he said, you go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. He didn't tell you to pray and ask him to do it. That's chicken prayer. This is the way most people pray. If you say, oh God, we know that we are nothing, but that you can do all things. Would you stretch forth your hand? Did you know if nothing happens, then you can blame it on God because you admitted you had no power. But if you come and say, God told me, to go heal the sick. He told me to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I have the power. Over in the third chapter of the book of Acts, I'm gonna say this real quickly. I wish I had time to go over there, but you need to read this on your own. Peter and John were entering into the temple 
at the hour of prayer and they saw a man who was lame from his mother's womb and they looked at him and they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, such as I have, give I unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they reached down and grabbed the man by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. A man who was over 40 years old, had never walked in his life, instantly started leaping and running. And they never prayed. They didn't ask God to heal him. They said, such as I have, give I unto thee. If you were to do that in most churches in America today, they would brand you a heretic. They'd kick you out and say, who do you think you are? Don't you know that without Jesus, you're nothing? I agree. Jesus said that in John chapter 15, verse five, without me, you can do nothing. And I believe that 1000%, but I'm never without Jesus. And through Jesus, I can do all things. And for you to come and say, oh God, would you please heal me? I could just imagine Jesus at the Father's right hand and the Father's looking over at Jesus and saying, didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Why are they asking me to do what I've already done? Don't they understand that you gave them power? And yet the average Christian, and I, I believe you guys, this is a Friday night, isn't it? And instead of you out doing something else, you're here listening to me. And so you're a fanatic or you were drugged here by a fanatic. You're the cream of the crop. I'm not criticizing you, but I, I can guarantee you the majority of people sitting right in this room, when you have a need, you go to God. No, God, here's what the doctor said. Would you please heal me? And then you wait on God. And he said, I gave you power over sickness and over disease. You cast them out. You heal the sick. It's not your power. It's God's power, but it's in you. It's at your disposal. You have to speak to the mountain. Oh God, talk to my mountain for me. That won't work. He would have to lie. He'd have to violate his word. The whole world would have to self-destruct for him to answer your prayer. He said, you speak to the mountain. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. God and the devil aren't in direct conflict today. Jesus meant the devil, went to hell, came out with the keys of death and of hell, and Satan is a defeated foe. There is zero, there is zero conflict directly between God and the devil. And he gave us all of that power. Satan isn't fighting directly with God. He's fighting against us trying to keep us in ignorance, in blindness, so that we just come and say, oh God, would you please heal me? And you aren't using the power and the authority that you've got. You're waiting on God to heal you. And God's waiting on you to use what you got. You aren't speaking to the problem. You aren't taking your authority and commanding things to happen. We don't understand the authority that God has given us. Man, what I'm saying is powerful. And yet the majority of people don't live this way. They think that God can do anything, but he has done nothing. And so we've got to ask him to send. I prayed with people today about getting born again and they, oh God, would you please save this person? God has done everything it takes to save the entire world. The sins of the entire world have been paid for. God's done his part. It's not up to God whether people get saved or not. There's two things involved. First of all, they have to hear before they can get faith to be saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how can they hear without somebody preaching? So there's two things. Somebody's got to speak the word to them. And then the second thing, they have to willingly obey. God doesn't force anybody to get saved. And yet we have people today that will fast and pray and plead and bawl and squall and do all kinds of things trying to get God to save somebody. But you wouldn't dare talk to them because they might roll their eyes at you. They might resist you. You aren't planting the seed. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. You have to be born again by the seed of God's word coming into your heart. It's not up to God whether people get saved. It's up to us. We're the ones that have the seed. 
angels aren't preaching the gospel. You've got to stand up and preach the gospel. You've got to do it. And God will confirm the word that you speak with signs and wonders following. But we've got Christians today that will spend huge amounts of time in your prayer closet praying and begging God to pour out his spirit. But you wouldn't dare go and raise somebody from the dead, command a blind eye to open. You're waiting on God to do it. God's waiting on you to do it. These signs follow them that believe. You know, this lady that her blind eye was open, that she gave the testimony. That wouldn't have happened if there hadn't have been some person down here praying for her and ministering to her. And yet God wanted her healed, but he uses people. God does not move sovereignly independent of people. I just stepped on hundreds of people's tradition right there, but that's an absolute true statement. You can see it in many things. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That tells you God's, it is not God's will for any person to die, but that every person should be saved. And yet Jesus said, there's going to be more people go to hell than there will go to heaven. God's will doesn't automatically come to pass. You know why? Because he gave you authority and he will not force you to be saved. He won't force anybody you're praying for to be saved. They have a choice. This whole idea, people say, man, I've had people come up to me and say, you're of the devil to preach that God is sovereign. Nothing happens but what it's God's will. You're of the devil. And I'll say, hey, nothing could happen but what it's God's will. It must be God's will for me to be preaching this. <laughs> and these people that tell me everything is controlled by God will sit there and say, you aren't controlled by God. And I'll just turn around. Well, you're violating your own teaching. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Let me give you an example of this, that I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, where Pastor Karen and um, Todd are from. And I was ministering there. And, um, and anyway, I was staying with some people. And the woman had seen the testimony, I think, of Nikki Oshinsky. She was here this morning. I don't know if she's here tonight. Is Nikki here tonight? I think she's coming tomorrow morning. But Nikki was raised off of her deathbed, and we've got a video about it on my website that you can go and look at. First time I met Nikki, she was a teenager, and she was sent home to die. And I met her on her deathbed, and tell them what Jesus did for you, Nikki. In the darkest times of when I was sick, one of the worst nights to give you the edited version, I was in the bathroom for three hours and my mom was having to hold me up. And my, my legs, it was, it was hell. And all of a sudden, that's the night my, that God chose to give my mom a, a prophetic word about my husband. And she starts prophesying to me right there in the bathroom. Your husband will be like an eagle. He will always have lots of things in his pockets. He will be highly educated and he won't care that you had to drop out of school when you were 14. He will know more about the grace message than you do. She told me all these things about him. Then I met this guy <laughs> and it was like every part of me was confirming this is who God was calling me to be with. Dating, huh, dating. Our moms dated more than we dated. So during that time, there was a blessing that covered everything and our moms were like, oh yeah, and they were hanging out and we were spending time together. I say to him, why did you fall in love with me? And he says, because when I saw your video, you told me about the Jesus I know. You know my Saint Jesus. From there, it, just, it was a rapid engagement and a rapid marriage and it, it was amazing. It was like falling off a log. And the basis of our relationship is our, our love relationship with Jesus. And so we got married 11 months after I got healed and he never knew me sick. With Nikki, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like I'm with Nikki and Jesus and everything's just good. When we got married, we agreed we'd try to have kids after five years. And after a year of trying with nothing, our doctor sent us somewhere else. And we got sent to one of the top fertility specialists in Dallas. And he, I remember him sitting down after taking tests and looking me square in the eye and saying, you will never have children. 
unless I give you this drug, this drug, these shots, that, we'll try that, but then we're probably gonna have to go past that. And so I went home to Mark and we said, okay, well, we'll just do the first level of fertility treatments that they said. We'll just do the pills and some shots. And we did it for three months and I lost my chill. <laughs> I had no filter. My emotions were like this. Um, I was not, the grace train had left the building and crazy town had come. I mean, the hormones are a crazy thing to mess with. And I remember almost being asleep this is three months into it. No, no babies, no babies. Almost asleep and Mark said, Nick, I need to tell you that God told us to have a baby. And I said, yeah, I know. And he said, he didn't tell us for you to take drugs and have a baby. He told us that we were going to have a baby. And when you have the baby that God wants us to have, he wants you the strongest and healthiest that you've ever been to carry this baby. And I said, yeah, I know. I don't feel that way right now. I feel crazy. And he said, I think we need to stop and get you strong and healthy and balanced. And then let God do what he said he was going to do. Zachary was born a month before our 10th wedding anniversary. I remember the first thing when she held him that said, I gave you a son. And we were crying together because it was, yes, it was amazing. Perfect whole, 10 fingers, 10 toes, a son just like God had showed Mark that we would have a son and one day a daughter. And I remembered holding him and thinking, my body, God put him in my body and it worked perfect. Without drugs or anything, he came and it was awesome. And then our daughter followed on and, and that was just as good. And She's turning into a beautiful person. Now what else does he need? Now he needs a mama. Oh, he needs a mama, I agree. She's a wonderful little girl. I love you. They like to play chase and um, hide and seek. Wait! <laughs> We're just about to start Zach into the soccer programs and start getting to see him play on the soccer field and whatnot. He is all about gaming. Now, whether he is going to be eSports ready or not, I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt he can handle the, the StarCraft II eSports yet, but he's interested, he's motivated. Some men dream that their son will be in the NFL. You you hope he's an eSport gamer battling it out against the teams. That's what yep. Yep, that's or your on a Korean team. I think you're hilarious. Cross culture. You know, I'm all for that. That's good. It's an international fair. I just think you're hilarious. Oh, oh, Please help me. So, Pops and Grandma are the grace for um, having a break from the children, and that's an abundant blessing. So, that's my parents' payback is enjoying the fruit of after I was healed, God put us together. Now they have the fruit of the grandkids that wouldn't have been, and now they're they're great grandparents. So in 17 years, the only time the sickness ever tried to come back was the first night. Uh, and I, I believe I shared it before where I went to run up the stairs and my legs didn't want to go. And I yelled at my legs and said, you will go upstairs. And I walked up the stairs and then I got up there and went to put on makeup before we went to church. And I had a reaction to the makeup. My hands turned bright red and I said, no, you are a pale white woman. You will wear makeup. <laughs> no, and it, it went away. I haven't had a symptom since then. Yes, it's true. But I had the opportunity to latch onto that as my identity and it would have stayed. I think that the main reason people get healed and then they lose it is because they don't allow the Lord to change who their identity is to themselves. If I still identified as that sick girl, as that girl that if something happened it always made everything else complicated and if a little thing happened to my body the rest of my body would respond. Um, I think I would still be sick today. I really do. One thing I learned the night that my healing manifested was to stand up and say, no, no, and it has to flee. It's not waiting for God to do it. It's, it's Him setting the table before you with all the good things and Him saying, eat. And now, as I'm home with my children, I'm so thankful because I can turn on gospel TV or 
Andrew or Dwayne Sheriff or whoever and listen to the word and fill up and feed myself so that when I do get squeezed, the word pops out. And when the morning comes again, it'll shine so bright and proud. I get messaged mostly through Facebook, almost daily from people all over the world that have heard my story, which is kind of trippy when you're homeschooling your kids and doing your thing, that God's taken what the story, what I feel is our family story. And people say they were so blessed because of, of the, the relationship I had with Jesus or one little thing I said about trusting Him with half a second by half a second. Anybody can do anything for half a second with the grace of God. And I've heard of people receiving their healing because they've heard keys or a little thing that was the, the one thing they didn't know. It's different for everybody because everybody's walk is different or what they have to hear in their heart is different. He healed me because He loved me. And He showed my family the truth because He loves us, but He has been able to take our testimony and share it with other people and use it to show who He really is to them. Man, it doesn't get better than that, does it? It's the gift that keeps on giving in so many ways. And I love that over and over when God would speak to me when I was sick, it was never about not being sick. It was always about who He had really called me to be and what He had for me, apart from all that. Because when He, when he designed me, he, he never knew about fibromyalgia. He never saw the car wreck. He never saw environmental sensitivities or wheelchairs or disappointments. None of that was supposed to be in the story. And so over this time, he showed me what his original story was for me. And that was my family and also to teach other women how to love their families. If I had stayed full force into teaching others about healing, it would be wonderful and I still do and it is a great honor and a privilege to have the right to speak about that. But if I don't let it be married with the original design of my Creator, I would not be a whole person. My life would not be nearly as fulfilling. And so part of what is burning in me is to tell people that regardless of what part of your life has fallen and not in the original design of your Creator, when you get free of that, and, and, and away from that, and you step into what God has for you, look and ask Him what the original design is, and don't stay there only celebrating freedom from what was never supposed to be. Because I wouldn't have looked past that, and I wouldn't have been a whole person. This isn't a story about something that happened to me almost 17 years ago. God's still writing it, and the whole story is awesome. So, thank you. Awesome.